Listen, I'm easy to find. And listen, they can kiss my ass if they don't like it. What's going on? Nathan back with another great presentation. Hope you're all well. Hope you're all staying safe. Happy Taco Tuesday. Uh, before we get into the video, there's a few things I need to say up front. Uh, this video has been recorded. Uh, episode, this is episode three. I want to say this. Yes, episode three, season five of the podcast. Um, if you're enjoying the content that you're seeing, you want to see more of this, uh, consider hitting that subscribe button along with notification bells on. When you give me some uh, suggestions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, thank you for the support that you've given me in this channel. Uh, episode four will most likely go up Friday evening. I'm not sure yet. I'm not debating if that'll be recorded or live. So in this episode, um, recap the Ravens and the Browns, Washington football team in Dallas, the Bills versus Tampa Bay, and Mr. Dimple Chen himself, Tom Brady, the Rams versus the Cardinals, the Chiefs play the Los Angeles Chargers Thursday night. So I got to give a like a, my prediction preview in that game. Uh, go over the week 14 picks. And then we get in our segment of the playoff race, things will happen in the NFL. Uh, there's not really much updates. Uh, this is day, thir day 13 of the strike for Major League Baseball. Uh, the Washington Wizards, I got to get into them. Uh, Maryland, National Signing Day, Couple we got a couple guys recruited to play for the University of Maryland. Uh, Maryland's men, we beat number 20 Florida, but however, the number eight Lady Terps lost to the number one South Carolina Gamecocks. With oh children. my God. And then also too, we're going to get into Towson basketball. I kind of want to talk about the WNBA draft lottery, what to expect from that. And then I also want to talk about Tiffany Mitchell uh, for the Indiana Fever. Uh, a couple of the, there was something that was really, really interesting on her story that I want to talk about. So uh, let's get into it. Um, the Ravens, we <laughs> lost 24-20. Um, I was not expecting that, to be honest with you. Um, second half, once again, looked really, really bad. I mean, it looked really good in the first half. Couldn't really get anything going. Um, to be down in the first half, 17 nothing, and then to lose Lamar Jackson to a high ankle sprain. Uh, we signed Josh Johnson. By all accounts, that means he's not going to be playing this week, Lamar. Um, Tyler Huntley stepped in there and actually did really well under pressure. Uh, where you're going into the second half, you're already down. You can't your offense, nothing's getting going. Uh, defensively, just not looking good. I mean, we had Anthony Averick. He was the first interception in the six weeks that we had. Um, I will say that um, offensively, there are some things that need to be addressed. Lamar Jack, the offensive line needs to be fixed. Um, Kevin Zettler and Bradley Bozeman, from what I understand, according to PFF rankings, they have not allowed a sack. Uh, Alejandro Veranueva is making $8 million next year. He needs to be gone. Ben Powers. I get he's still young and developing. Uh, Patrick McCarry, he's out, and they had Tyree Phillips in there. Um, that that can't happen. Now, in the first half, the Browns, Baker Mayfield had 190 yards for two touchdowns and threw a pick. Now, defensively, Baltimore, Cleveland held Baltimore to one of 12 third down attempts, four sacks, and then Tyler Huntley fumbled the ball twice, particularly Miles Garrett, um, De Del Pitt had 11, Josh Johnson had six tackles, Troy Hill had three tackles, and Jadavion Clowney had a sack and a half. And then um, McKinley had a, he had the sack and the forced fumble. Now, um, when you're down 10 points and you lose Lamar Jackson, that's, 
by all the means, you would think your team would just quit. But no, I didn't see that. Tyler Huntley was 27 or 38 for 270 yards. Uh, I think he had 45 yards on six carries. I do think the two fumbles were were cost. Were, 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 they, were the, was the deciding factor in the game. Uh, when I look at Mark Andrews, Mark Andrews had 11 catches for 11, uh, 115 yards. Rashard Bateman had his first 100 game um, York game and also had a touchdown taken away from him. That was a touchdown. Uh, Huntley's ability to read the cover zero blitz looked a lot better than what I expected. Um, I think with Lamar, I think it's all mental. I really do. Uh, particularly on the play, the play where Rashard Bateman got a uh, – he scored where well, it, it should have been a touchdown, but it wasn't. He got rid of the ball real effectively. And I think with Lamar, I think that's going to take time. I don't know. To me, I think it's just, at, again, it goes back to what I said, it's all mental. I feel like there goes back to coaching, not helping him see, see that. I think giving him the ability to audible, but also to, I think, Having an offensive line and you know picking out your assignments, I the center to me he should be saying, "Hey, get this guy, get this guy, get that guy." I don't see that. I think for people to say that on the play where Lamar got injured, where there was intent, there was intent of uh, him and them trying to intentionally injure him, I don't see that. I we can we can disagree, and that's okay. But I don't see where it was intentional. Uh, I also think the biggest thing was. The penalties, we've got flagged 10 times, and that cost us 125 yards. Uh, I thought Harbaugh trying to go for two, I didn't think that made any sense. Just take the three and play defense. Uh, I will say, again, when it, the, the fourth and sixth, they got it. I don't know why you check down on a fourth and six. I, I don't know. Um, very, very just dis disappointing. Uh, we have four games left. We got to go up against Mr. Aaron Rodgers and his bad toe and the Green Bay Packers. And it's a home game. Uh, like I said, Lamar Jackson is not going to play. I don't know what to expect. Uh, we signed Tony Jefferson. Tony Jefferson played for us a couple, for a couple years. He's a proven veteran. Me personally, I feel like the ship's already listing. I don't really see what he can do um, much. I, I think that when the offseason comes comes for us, there's going to have to be some, some serious conversations. This team has to be retooled. It truly does. I'm just not – I'm looking at the makeup of this team – it doesn't look – and it's not a championship team. This is really, honestly, truthfully, not a playoff team. I have said it, and I'm on the record for saying it. This year reminds me of 2015. And that same year, we could have made the playoffs, but down the stretch when you lose Flacco, Suggs, Forsett, Steve Smith Sr., that stings. And then, like, again, yeah, like, you know, we're one of three in the division. I mean, we can celebrate we're still in first place, but – you know, let's let let let's 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 be honest for a second. Are we excited because are we in first place because we're lucky, or the AFC is just that is is just that wide open? All right, we gotta we kind of have to ask those questions. So um, tough loss, but I I do I really am proud of the fact that when Lamar went down, we didn't quit. We still we stuck. We put our head down and we came back in the game. I'm happy for that. Uh, the Browns, they play Saturday against the Las Vegas Raiders. And the way it's looking right now, the Browns have 14 players on the COVID list. And from what I read on Bleacher's Report earlier, uh, before I came on, uh, the game is still on. I don't know what to expect. Uh, I mean, it's kind of really being – I'll get two more when the – around the NFL news, a kid's kind of a mess right now. So 
we'll see. So let's talk about the Washington football team. Uh, we lost to the Dallas Cowboys. That was a tough one. Uh, that, 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 that was really tough. Uh, biggest things I took away from it. In the first quarter, we were down 18 points. Going into the second half, we were down 24. Michael Parsons sacked Ty Heineke twice and forced a fumble. Um, when Mike McCarthy guaranteed the Dallas the Cowboys were going to win that game, they sure did. Uh, there was a lot of things. I want to. I want to break this down to you. Injuries caught up to us on the offensive line. Uh, that that stings for me. Uh, we couldn't get anything really going offensively. Often they struggled with Dallas's pass rush, and then Antonio Gibson couldn't get anything going. I think honestly, this was Taylor Heineke's. This is not one of his best performances that I have seen since he's been starting a Washington. I will say that for the record. Um, and I, I was having a conversation with a uh, shot to Sean Spencer, you know, is it me? Is it Scott Turner or maybe it was a Taylor? And it, it's kind of, it's kind of 50, 50. Uh, Antonio Gibson has this case of fumbleitis. He's now as sick. He's now six fumbles on the year, and I've noticed when he fumbles, they don't put him in the game uh, until it's like late. Now they brought Kyle Allen in there. He did get injured, and you know, you know, played with Ron, Ron Rivera, and he has played last year. Um, still, it just wasn't enough. Uh, the, the, he had to pass DeAndre Carter. I thought the play uh, we threw the Cam Sims that should have been a touchdown, and it should have been and it should have been challenged, but it didn't happen. Defensively, I'd say we looked pretty pretty good. You know, we didn't have uh, Montez Sweat, Jonathan Allen, or Chase Young. They got to Dak Prescott and I definitely, and something obviously with Dak isn't looking right. I do feel like I've noticed when Zeke and Tony Pollard are not there, Dallas has turned one dimensional. And I do think Kellen Moore has to make the game. Again, it goes back to coaching. Got to make the, got to make the game simple and easy. I think something is going to have to be some adjustments. I think Dak's trying to overcompensate too much, and I think it's starting. It's starting to show because the way Dak's playing, and I agree. And I agree with the Ryan Clark. Shout out to Ryan Clark. They're not going to win the Super Bowl with the way he's performing right now. Um, again, disappointing, but this this one this 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 one this stings. I'm not going to lie; it does. Um, you know. You know, for me, I, I just feel that like Washington, I still think they're there. I mean, they're six and we're now falling six and seven on the year. Um, but I, this this kind of stinks. Like Charles Leno, Charles Charles Leonard, Leno got injured, had a back injury. Tyler Larson had a, a leg injury, and then Sammy Reyes had a concussion. Um Terry McLaurin, <laughs> you know, got evaluated. For a concussion, so I mean, I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of, I don't know, a lot of Washington. We shot ourselves in the we shot ourselves in the foot, but I think Dallas was ready to play this game. I do. So uh, we play. I want to say it's the Eagles next, and. Philadelphia's coming off a bye week, if I remember correctly. And these next three games, 
Yeah, they're playing. Ooh. Oh, huh. they're playing. Let me look at the schedule because they're playing Philadelphia. Their schedule is actually kind of actually really. Philadelphia, they got to play Dallas the day after Christmas. Then the Eagles. And then they're going to finish the for the Giants. That's interesting. So I think I think Washington will be okay, but this one if if I think if we won the, if we had won this game and a couple costly mistakes, we take those away. I I think that I think this game was ours. Another game I, I wanted to talk about was I thought honestly a game of the week. Uh, the Buffalo Bills versus Mr. Dimple Chin and the Buccaneers himself, and the Buccaneers Tom Brady. Um, you know, <laughs> the Buccane the, the Bills were down 24-3 at halftime. I'm sitting there and I'm texting a friend and I'm like, you know, this this Bill team, man, I, I don't I, I don't I can't get my, my 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 I can't get my thought around it. Like why are they not performing to the best of their like why are they not the team we everybody said at the beginning of the year? This is the team that's gonna win the AFC East. And okay, I'm like at halftime, I'm like, okay, you know, they look demoralized. I, I I just don't see the Bills coming back. I don't see them winning the game. Like I think it's gonna be like they'll probably probably on like a touchdown, be like 30, like 41 10. And then all of a sudden, uh, you got you got a comeback, you know, from going 24 3 nothing to tying the game. Um, you know, particularly like again, Josh Tom Brady, he had 30, he 363 yards, two touchdowns. He actually rushed, he actually ran the ball. 16 times, I think it was. And then Leonard Fournette had 113. Uh, Josh Allen, 308 yards. He had two touchdowns, a rushing touchdown, and he also did the interception. Um, again, I have to really call out Sean McDermott. I'm not really sure his playmaking decisions. Um I feel like there was a lot of times they could have stayed on the field and that didn't happen. And in the first half, like he, I think it was like on his own 45, he punted the ball. And then it was like a fourth and two, fourth and three in the third quarter. And I'm like, go for it. Doesn't do it. Um, Defensively, like, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't. Um, I don't know what they were doing defensively. Like, I, I knew this was, that's how I knew the game. This is how I knew the game was over. That the coin toss, right? That's when I knew the coin toss was over. The game was over. Like the Bucks moved down the field. They didn't have any. Like the Bucks gave them just no opportunities to come back. And then he throws that touchdown, the game winning touchdown, which was his 700th career touchdown to Richard Pyramid, Tom Brady. Congratulations! Oh, oh my God. Fun fact I looked this up. This was on Stat News. This was the Bills' fifth loss this season that was decided by seven or fewer points. Um, that's the worst. And since any team in the last decade, that was interesting. That was an interesting stat. Um, I, I just don't – I don't see it. I, I don't with the Bills. I, I got to – they got to prove it to me. Um, I, I just feel like you have all the pieces. Like, what's the issue? And I don't know. I really don't. Let's transition to uh, Monday night. Last night, the Los Angeles Rams beat the St. Louis, St. Louis, the Arizona Cardinals. I apologize. Um, the Rams were ready for this. They were ready for this game. 
you know, I kind of have to sit back and eat my words. Because at the beginning of the year, where they got Matthew Stafford, I was having this conversation with, um, I think it was on the round table again, shot to Sean Spencer, Delilah Crespo, Nick Rosario. And they got Matthew Stafford. And I said, well, did, Matt, did Russell Wilson die? Like, did Seahawks die or something? And when I look back on that trade and look at the way the seasons look so far, I have to eat my words. Like, Matthew Stafford had three touchdowns in this game uh, the, defensively. Aaron, Aaron Donald and the crew did their things. Aaron Donald had three sacks. Uh, the, the, the Cardinals, like, I feel like they just had no answers. I think, I think physically and I think mentally, I think they got. I think Los Angeles wore them down. I do. Uh, so with that loss, the Cardinals now have to wait that the next week, and they just lost DeAndre Hopkins. He may have to miss the rest of the year with a knee injury. So that sucks. Uh, and I know Kyler threw two interceptions. Um, Odo. Beckham Jr. and Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup, who's a cheat code in my fantasy in my fantasy league, uh, had a touchdown apiece. Uh, he actually was funny. Cooper Cup could actually be this year's NFL Triple Crown winner uh, at the rate he's been playing, and I, and I think he actually arguably could be the best wide receiver. He's making an argument for one of the best. He's the best receiver in the game. Uh, the Cardinals def. I, I know they, they had a chance in the, in the game to come back, but there was a holding call, and that 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 was it. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I think I, I really think the Rams are ready for them. Um, you know, just it just sucks. Now. I know Jalen wrote Jalen Jalen Rose Jalen Ramsey didn't play Tyler Higby didn't play because uh, with COVID, um, and then again, like fun fact, the Cardinals they are they are a better home, a away team, but when they're home, they're five hundred. I think their were home record of seven and zero. And fun fact, Andrew Whitworth turned forty recently. He's the oldest player. To play at left tackle at age 40. Like, bro, Hall of Fame. <laughs> um, shout out to Andrew Wentworth. Um, Thursday night, the Kansas City Chiefs play the Los Angeles Chargers. This actually should be a good game, to be honest. Uh, a couple things. You know, the Chiefs are coming off a very, very big victory over the Las Vegas Raiders. Um <laughs> And the Chargers, uh, for me, like, I only regret with Justin Herbert is I wish he was still on my fantasy football team. But uh, that's that, that's okay. Um, you know, I just – it happens. But a couple things I'm looking to see from both offenses. I want to see which one gets it going first. Um, the Chiefs are starting to pick it up. The run game has picked up a lot better with Kansas City. Shout out, shout out to them. They're looking really better. The last three games, he's had six touchdowns. Uh, Travis uh, Kelsey, I know he's had a touchdown. You had someone with named Derek Gore and, of course, Patrick Mahomes. Uh, Clyde, Clyde uh, Edwards Hilarious coming back. He's had those three touchdowns after the uh, injury. Look, they're looking really better. And then don't forget, you got Darnell Williams in there too. Tyreek Evans. It's starting to look better. I just think, again, just get the mode. To, I think you just got to give it time, give the, the energy flow, and again, looks really better. Um, now, they did go up against a team that needs to just rebuild. Uh, they need to really free Derek Carr from Las Vegas. I feel like his talents are just being wasted. I do. Um, and Josh Jacobs. I, I just don't – like this team, the Raiders, they just got the clean house. They do. Um, now – with the Chargers, I think again Justin Herbert is a gunslinger. Like he's got he got some he's got uh, this kid named Jalen uh, Garyon Guyton. He's he, you know he's been pretty, actually pretty good. I think he had like two touchdowns I think in the previous game. 
You got Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler. I know he got injured playing the Giants. I think he is expected to play. He's questionable. So probably we'll hear something by Wednesday evening or something like that. So we'll kind of see what it looks like. Um, what's interesting, again, I looked at the I looked at this stat. Patrick Mahomes has just as many touchdowns in the last, I think it was three weeks, than the Chiefs do defensively. Uh, the if you remember the Ted, the Teddy Bridgewater uh, pick six, and yeah, <laughs> um, they're still ranked twenty fourth. Ironically, defensively, uh, and, and again the same. And look at the Chiefs as well. They're kind of eh. They're like 29th against the rush from what I saw. Uh, I know Darren James was dealing with a hamstring injury against the Giants, so I don't know if he's going to play or not. Uh, I don't really – I kind of want to see what they're going to do against the run game, particularly Williams and Edwards Edwards Hilaire. So I I think this is going to be a a shootout. I do. Uh, I think the San Diego Chargers – San Diego – the Los Angeles Chargers – are going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs 45-41. Guaranteed! Let's transition into Nathan's picks. Week 14. Let's... (laughs) All right, week 14. This This was pretty interesting. So, obviously, the... Minnesota Vikings beat the Pittsburgh Steelers 36-28. The Steelers, I mean the Saints, excuse me, the Orleans Saints beat the Jets 30-9. The Falcons beat the Panthers 29-21. The Seahawks beat the Texans 33-13. And we all know the the Raiders got their ass kicked by the Kansas City Chiefs 48-9. And you already know about the Ravens losing by two to the Browns. Dallas beating Washington. The Tennessee Titans blanketed the Jacksonville Jaguars 20 to nothing. The Denver Broncos beat the Detroit Lions 38 to 10. And unfortunately, sadly, the Detroit Lions have been eliminated from the playoffs. This, the Los Angeles Chargers beat the Giants 37 21. I feel like this is a good game. The San Francisco 49ers beat the Cincinnati Bengals in overtime 26 23. This was actually not bad. This At first, it was starting to look a good game, but then come the third and fourth quarter, it was kind of like starting to run away. The Green Bay Packers beat the Chicago Bears 45-30, and that is week 14. So with that being said, we're going to transition into our segment, the Jim Mora. Uh, playoffs? Don't talk about playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Thank you, Jim Mora. So, um, as of today, things could change. Uh, <laughs> this is still look. This is still anybody's race. Uh, as of right now, the New England Patriots and the Tennessee Titans and the Kansas City Chiefs are all tied for the same for the for the same record, first place in their divisions respectively at nine and four. The fourth seed, uh, the Baltimore Ravens, us, we're eight and five, still first place in the AFC North. The Los Angeles Chargers, eight and five. The Indianapolis Colts and the Bill, Buffalo Bills tied seven to six, have the sixth and seventh seed respectively. I'm looking at who's on the who, if the playoffs ended today, these are your eight teams. I'm looking at those that are still there. You got the Cleveland Brownies, the San Francisco, ben, the San Francisco. Excuse me, I apologize. The Cincinnati Bengals, the Denver Broncos, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Las Vegas Raiders, and the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins are going to make the playoffs. Guaranteed! Excuse me.
excuse me, I do apologize for that. Uh, back to what I was saying. The Las Vegas Raiders will not make the playoffs. Guaranteed. I just don't see it. I don't see it with the Raiders. Uh, we, uh, if I could have the, uh, the Dennis Green clip, I should get that in the next time I do go live. We we are we knew who we thought they were. Um, it's a mess. The Denver Broncos, I think it's going to come down to this. I'm looking at the Broncos, Bengals, and the Browns. They all have the same record. Now, with Baker Mayfield, Kevin Stefanski, again, really quick, I, I, I want to say my thoughts and prayers. hope everybody gets well. Um, I have COVID. I don't know what's going to happen Saturday with this game against the Raiders. I don't. And uh, I don't think the Browns will make the playoffs. I don't. Um, the Cincinnati Bengals are right there. They act, and Ironically, they play the Bengals. I mean, the Broncos, excuse me. The Pittsburgh Steelers will not make the playoffs. Guaranteed. I really think that because their schedule, I think, is actually kind of tougher, in my opinion. They have to play Kansas City. That's a loss. Tennessee Sunday. That's a home game. Cleveland, and then us. They're probably going to win two of those games. They can go probably go 500. Um, but I just don't see it. The Broncos, I don't think, will make the playoffs. Guaranteed. Let's look at Denver's schedule. Denver plays Cincinnati this weekend. They've got the Raiders. But I don't think they'll beat the Chiefs and the Broncos. I think these last four games, if one of these four teams could go three and one, I think could get this seed. This seed. Now the Colts are playing the the, the 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 Patriots this weekend. The Indian, the New England Patriots are going to beat the Indianapolis Colts. Guaranteed. But I do think that the Bills will beat the Panthers. I do. Um, now, this is tough. I do think Baltimore. I know I was on the show. I was, I was was on the round table early this evening, and shout out to Anthony Handy. Um, I was holding it down for Nick Rosario, Delilah Cressman, and Sean Spencer. I did say earlier that the Ravens are not going to make the playoffs, and. Um, I'm in the air. I should have clarified that. But I do think this fourth spot, I think Baltimore is going to have the last spot. I think they're going to be a wild card team. I think that they'll most likely be a first round exit. Guaranteed. Um, but honestly and truthfully, if the playoffs ended today, I'm going to call it like I see it. This is these are your eight teams going to the playoffs. Guaranteed. For the NFC, you've got the Green Bay Packers, the Buccaneers, the Cardinals, 10 and 3, Dallas, the Rams, 9 and 4, San Francisco and Washington, 7, San Francisco 6 and 7 and 6, and Washington 6 and 7. I'm sorry, they're 17. These 14, these 17 in the AFC, if the playoffs are today, I think this is going to stay the same. I think it's going to stay consistent. I think these 17 in the AFC, excuse me, really quick. Are going to the playoffs now. According to NFL.com, the Giants, Bears, Seahawks, Panthers are still in the playoff race. The Chicago Bears are going to not make the playoffs. Yeah. The New York Giants will be eliminated from the playoffs. Guaranteed. The Los Angeles Rams are going to beat the Seahawks. Guaranteed. 
Cam Newton was just not enough for the Carolina Panthers. They're not making the playoffs. Guaranteed. Now, check this out. I don't think the Eagles will make the playoffs. I think they'll be the eighth seed because I'm looking at it right now. I hate to say it, say this, but your first five seeds, Green Bay, Tampa, Arizona, Dallas, the Rams, those are a lock. Guaranteed. Your six and seven seeds, that's a toss-up. The 49ers play the Falcons. Washington plays Philadelphia. I don't think – I think after next week, I think it'll be the Vikings, Eagles, Falcons, and the Saints in the playoff hunt. Um, I do. But these these other – these four teams, the Panthers, Seahawks, Giants, and Bears, no. They're not making the playoffs. It's just not happening. Um, but those that were eliminated, uh, the Detroit Lions will have the first overall pick in next year, in this upcoming year's draft. Then behind them, the Jacksonville Jaguars, Houston Texans, and then the New York J-E-T-S Jets, Jets, Jets. Um, it sucks. But that's your 17th. And again, like I said, that's set, that 6th and 7th seed in the NFC, I, 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 this is just me. I think the Saints could sneak in there and make the playoffs. Guaranteed. I think, I think the Saints can make the playoffs right there too. Because check it, the Falcons and the Saints, they're six and seven in the in the, in the same division in the same division, the NFC South. The Falcons are second, and the Saints are third. Philadelphia, they're third in the NFC East, and then Minnesota's right behind in second, is ironically second place. In the, in the NFC North. But what's funny, the Bears, their third. That actually should be interesting. I think the Bears, man, ugh, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens this weekend. And the NFC is just tricky. It really is. But uh, that's going to conclude. Uh, playoffs? Don't talk about playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Shout out to Jim Moore. Uh, around the NFL. So, uh, as I talked about it, we already are dealing with a plethora of COVID uh, happening, uh, spreading around the NFL. 90 players are now on the COVID list. Uh, as of today, um, which is Tuesday going into Wednesday, uh, 40 players were put, placed on the COVID reserve list. Um, the Browns, Raider, I know the Raiders had a list. The uh, Falcons had a couple. The Ravens had one. Tristan Colon, Bills, I think the Bears had up until last night I saw it was like five. Uh, the Browns, the way it's looking, they can have more. Uh, the Lions also, too. The Texans they had some names in there as well. They just have one name, but I think by tomorrow, I think you'll see more, more uh, guys on the list. Uh, it's getting kind of scary, to be honest with you, uh, because I know, like, from what I read somewhere, like the Rams, they shut down their facility uh, for practice, and I really, you know, I, I understand it, you know. We all want to get back to a norm, what normalcy was, but we still have a responsibility to be, smart, be you know, to protect ourselves and be careful. Like I just again, I encourage people to educate themselves on these things, um, stay safe. You know, I, I get it. I I want to you know get back to what life was before COVID, but I have to do I have to do my part. I do, and. It's just it takes all of us to do that. So, um, as far as um, there was a situation, a former NFL player, his name is Philip Adams, he killed six people. It came out that he had CTE, uh, stage two, and it's sad because 
you know, these these guys are human. And 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 I get it from from Pee Wee League to pros, you know, that's all they've been doing is playing football. But these guys are human at the end of the day. Um it's just sad that these kind of things go to not they, 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 I wish that these guys would go get them addressed. I think also too it's gonna to take the NFL to do some, do its part as well. Uh, to help these guys get the help that they need. I do. Um, it just sucks. It really does. Uh, you hate to see that. And I read an article somewhere where, like, the players, I think it's like AL, ALS, NFL players are more suscept- are susceptible of getting it. That's crazy to me. That really is. Um Sad. Also, a couple things coming out of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Urban Meyer, by day by day, is starting to look bad for him. Uh, whereas reading something where Marvin Jones and him got into it, um, I read something where he supposedly kicked Josh Lambeau. It's a mess in Jacksonville. It is. Um, but again, a lot of that starts at the top from ownership. You have an owner that's more invested in wrestling than the football team, to me, in my personal opinion. Um, and that that's just not right. I, I hate that. Uh, but I do think, I do believe, excuse me, Urban Meyer will be, he will be fired after this year. It's just a mess. Uh, the NFL Salary cap for next year is just projected to be two, two hundred million dollars. So we'll we'll see because uh, I think that's going to help some teams, but there's still going to be some teams operating in the red. The Las Vegas Raiders will host the Super Bowl in 2024. I wonder when they're going to get. A Super Bowl here in the DMV. I, I really do, but we'll see. Now, um, I wanted to talk about Washington. So, uh, supposedly, Daniel Snyder is finding himself in some more stuff. So, apparently, he tried to block an ex-employee, tried to block an interview, what's been going on, who accused him of, I think it was sexual misconduct. And again, from what the report said, the article said that I know in the Washington Post, the team, it was like almost $2 million. It's like, I want to say it was like like $1.5, $1.6 million that they settled with the woman that accused them. Um, Because she did threaten to sue him. And she said it took place on this private plane. And again, some people, the league probed and said there was no interference. Uh, I I don't get it. Again, it just is saying, it goes goes back to what I was saying a few episodes ago. I was talking about the Chicago Blackhawks and how you have a league of owners who turned a blind eye and did nothing to say, yo, we can't let that happen. And what the I'm, I'm disappointed at Cordell and these owners because what this pretty much is, is just like with the Blackhawks almost. Well, we're turning a black, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. And I don't understand these kind of things like he needs to be like he needs to be gone as an owner. And Roger Goodell comes out and says, We didn't find any interference with the investigation whatsoever. Bullshit. Like you even have I mean, two members of Congress running a probe with Daniel Sanders and this evidence. 
I think uh, one was a Demo- was someone from New York, and another one was from Illinois. Now, the Washington football team was fined in July $10 million. Uh, for, I mean, to me, that's kind of like, well, we, we okay, we're just going to give you this, this punishment just to shut the people up and say that we actually are doing something about it. They got fined $10 million. Of course, uh, the culture was toxic and, and the ownership, something like that, uh, didn't pay attention to anything of sexual um Miss Harassment. Uh, I think her name was Miss w- Miss Wilkin Miss Wilkinson. Uh, that's who they hired. I think it was to do the investigation. It's it's just a mess. Like I w- like what more do you need to see with this guy as owner? And it's crazy. It's crazy. I kind of am curious to see what Will Kramer. Congratulations to Will Kramer and his wife on their newborn. Sean Spencer and Ad Lowe. I wonder what they're going to say on Washington Football Weekly. I really do. Um, the next hiring cycle, I know the NFL is trying something with the interviews. Um, I think that's where I kind of want to see some other guys get opportunities, get coaching, get coaching gigs. Uh, Raheem Morris would be a good candidate. Mel Tucker. Um, I kind of want to see that. I think there needs to be more a push, but not just for coaches. I kind of want to see more GMs, even owners. Does me. There's some guys on there I could see being head coaches. Uh, and with that being said, that's all around the NFL that I saw for you. I did have, I do have a video for you that's going to be at the end of this video. It's going to be with, with one Mr. Uh, Jason Kelsey. So let's transition into Major League Baseball. Uh, nothing so far, unfortunately. Uh, no updates other than the Astros. They did approve Verlander's contract. It was a two-year deal for $50 million. Uh, that got approved just before they went on strike. Uh, it looks like the league and the players, it's the owners of the Players Association, uh, not until after the new year. That's what it's looking like. Uh, it's kind of really honestly, truthfully, I think this is just everybody is just going in their corner and, you know, taking a deep breath and hopefully going back to the, to the negotiating table and figure something out. Uh, Cam brought Pedroson, he said a minor league deal. Uh, a former Major League Baseball executive, his name was Roland Herman. He passed away uh, at the age of 92. Uh, most of my thoughts and prayers to him and his family. Uh, he was actually an assistant. He started as an assistant scout for the Milwaukee Braves uh, before they became the Atlanta Braves. He was a scout director for the Los Angeles Angels. Uh, then the White Sox. He also became the general manager. Uh, he actually, fun fact, he took over. He was a general manager for the Baltimore Orioles for 1988. That was the year we had Frank Robinson as our manager. And from the year before, I think we won like 33. It was a 33-game improvement, if I'm not mistaken. And he also, too, he was a senior VP the, with the Diamondbacks the four years from 96 to 2000. And um, he also went back to Chicago, won the World Series with them, and then uh, went back to Arizona. So uh, thoughts and prayers to his family, and uh, definitely, he definitely will be missed. Um, The Orioles, we made some coaching changes. Yes, um, a little, a little, not surprised, but I knew it was happening. Freddie Gonzalez <laughs> staying. Uh, he's now been, he, Freddie Gonzalez now from major, our major league coach to the bench coach. Uh, Jose Hernandez is actually going into now the major league coach 
we had hired someone. His name is, I have it here, Matt Borgshoot and Ryan Fuller. We have now two hitting coaches that are going to replace Don Long, who I didn't think really did a great job. That's just my opinion. Um, they both were in Bowie. That's our double-A team. Chris Holt is coming back. He's, a, he's our director of pitching and pitching coach. Darren Holmes is assistant pitching coach. Tim Cousins is our major league field coordinator and catching instructor. Uh, do we have someone, Tony Mancellino. He's coming back as a third base coach. Anthony Sanders at first base. Um, from what I understand, I know people were saying, I read an article about the Baltimore Sun that they were kind of wanting someone more to go on like and have more analytical coaches, but I don't think that happened. Um, I kind of, I kind of really want to see um, what this looks like. I know Brandon Hodges is his fourth year in Baltimore. I feel bad for him, honestly and truth, because he's had absolutely nothing to work with. He's he doesn't he has not. This team is young and it's. It's still got ways to go. It really does. Um, so I'm hoping that the team is a little better-ish, um, or at least see some improvements. In my in my opinion, uh, Gregory Polanco is going to play in Japan. He's nearing a deal. Uh, he just really wasn't that. I didn't see anything spectacular when he was with the Pirates. Um, and again, Major League Baseball players can sign minor league deals. Uh, still, now the man, the Mets have cut it down to three finalists for managers. You've got Buck Walter, okay. Uh, Buck Walter, I feel like could be the best fit. Uh, Joe Espin Espanda, I think he'd be good. Um, Matt Cantonero, I think I actually wouldn't be bad neither. Um, I know. Cantanero, he was with the Rays for three years. Wouldn't be bad. Um, Espada, I know he was with the – he actually interviewed for the Angels job. Then I, they hired Brad Osmond and then fired him after that. Um, Chris Woodward got the Rangers job. And then also, too, Gabe, he got interviewed for the Giants job, and they gave the Gabe Cutler. And then they, he actually interviewed for the Cubs and they gave the Dave Ross. Um, I actually was kind of surprised that we didn't kind of look at him. But this is just me. When I look at it, I think Buck Showalter makes the most sense because since, uh, what was his name, Terry Collins left, They need somebody that can handle the media well. Because, again, it's New York. It's media capital. I That's just me. That's just how I feel. Uh, I think he. I think all three are great. I don't know how Cantero and, and, and Espada will handle the media. We'll see. Um, but we'll see. Um, if, and my money, it would be on Buck Showalter. Um other than that, I know the Rule 5 draft should have started by now. Um, it looks like interesting. So the first round, we had drafted someone by the name of Noah Hoffman from the Mariners. Uh, I don't know any of these guys. I really don't. Um, Carson Fulmer was taken, wow, by the Dodgers? Huh. So the, what the Rule 5 draft is, any minor league player that's not protected on AAA roster, um, that means, well, okay, anyone that's not on the 40-man roster that doesn't have protection they can actually be taken. Like this year, I think it was, from what I understood, it was international high school players 
Um, though, and I think up until June of that year, 2017, I think they all had to be protected. The same thing. Um, now the world, the rule is when you're drafted on that team, you have to stick at that level. Now, if it doesn't work, they, the team has to pay, I think it's like $25,000, $24,000. And then they can, after that, go choose whatever the player wants to go. Uh, I don't really like it because a lot of teams, like after the next round, like I said, like the first two rounds, a lot of teams don't draft. So <coughs> the Orioles, we drafted Cole Yavila, a right-handed pitcher from the Rangers. Interesting. So – what else is happening? Let's check around and make sure. Um, also, I, mem I forgot to mention um, before we started the video, I wanted to send my thoughts and prayers to those that were affected by the storms in Kentucky, parts of Tennessee. I know Kirk, I think it was, um, I can't think of who it was, uh, Trip Gibson. He, um, he talked about how his whole he, he lost his home in a tornado. Um, he's a, I mean, he's a major league baseball empire. Um, it sucks. I hate to see that. Um, you know, people, you know, so low 100, you know, those that lost their lives. Um, you know, they talked about how this going to take a couple years for things to rebuild. Um, it just it just sucks, and I just want to send my thoughts and prayers to those uh, that were affected. Um, I mean, seventy people, and you know, six states all affected. It just and and and, and I'll get into that uh, in a little bit, but I just want to just also mention that and with MLB that's wrapping up for things around the MLB for baseball. The Washington Wizards are in transition in the basketball. Yes, you see the title. What the, you know what? Um, let me say this. As I sip tea. The Wizards. With oh, soul. my God. We suck. We, we really do. Um, I'm going to get into the Denver game. Tommy Shepard, I don't know if he'll ever see this video. I'm looking right, right at this camera. You have given me false hope as a Wizard fan. You really have. The way this team is constructed, I question it. We need a point guard. We have three forwards. Uh, there are times where this team goes on droughts of not scoring the ball. We're playing four on five basketball defensively because Bradley Bill's always looking for a call. And we're losing to teams where now, ever since that Charlie game, all, defense, all teams had to do was just play zone. Like, when you're a coach that, let's just call it what it is, who deserves to be a head coach, has to come out and dumb down the system for this team, that really tells me you've got guys on this team that don't know their roles. Not saying that these guys can't play, but the Wizards need something. And for people to sit there and say, well, we'll get Thomas Bryant back. We'll get Rui Hashimura. Yeah, they're energy, but they need, they lack of, they need, we need a point guard. Spencer Dinwiddie's not a point guard. He's a combo guard. They need somebody to, again, if, if you have somebody like Bradley Beal, if he's not going to probe, pick and roll, you know, they need something like, we don't have anyone to stretch the floor. Somebody's always standing in the paint. 
Now, I feel better. Fix this team. Lord have mercy. It's it's really it is really it's really disgusting. Like this game, we lost by we lost by four. No, I'm sorry, we lost by six. Excuse me, one thirteen, one oh seven. And if you really sit here and, and and try to tell me that this was actually they, they, this game. Regardless, was ugly basketball to watch. The last, I don't know, that we're now 20 games to the season. Going into the third quarter, the Washington Wizards were down by 33 damn points. The Denver Nuggets, I don't know what they were thinking, took their foot off the gas. And then before you know it, there was a score. This game was not respectable. The Joker had 28 points, 19 rebounds, and 31 minutes. Nine dime pieces. Now, the Joker did get ejected. I think it was like seven, six, six, six minutes left in the game. Jamal Murray still not back from injury. So Monte Morris, he was starting. He had 22 points. Like our starting five was lethargic. Bradley Beal had 19 points. Like the fact he had 19 points on 19 shots, that's awful to look at. But he did have 10, 10 nine pieces. His performance was trash. KCP, 5 of 16. Like, <laughs> Daniel Gafford, Gafford's a good player. But they really are going to have to figure something out. I, I just... Somebody, somebody got to go. Like Spencer Dinwiddie, I, I don't get it. Like they're passing up shots. Like Dinwiddie was three of eight, had three assists, had four turnovers. He shot twenty seven percent from the field. And then Denny, he was awful from three. He missed four threes, had three steals, but. <laughs> The real reason we came back was Aaron Holiday. He had 18 points. In those 15 minutes, had 18 points, 6 and 8 from the field. And also two Bertans. Bertans had 21 points. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that not only, what, two weeks ago, we were first place. We're starting to look like a team we that well there we go. Like we we are we are a seventh seed. We were just not tied for first place not not too long ago. See around, ladies and gentlemen, around 20 games. That's where you really start to see what your team looks like. And the Wizards showed me that. Now, this is what's going to kill me. They, I, bro, I, I had to look back at the game. So I've already talked about the takeovers. The turnovers. That's just hurt it. That just hurts us. But I don't understand this 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 habit of well, let's fall back down in games and then we try to make the game look respectable. That does that's just not working. That actually that that that's mediocre. That looks bad. Like I do think what's unsung that coaching staff 
are trying too much, are trying too hard to overcompensate. But when when Harsha Moore and Thomas Bryant come back, that that's great. But I really do think I think the Wizards need to make a trade. I'm not saying go out there and get me Jason Tatum. They need a true point guard. They don't have that. They have three forwards, and, and, and you got you, you need a floor. I think you need a floor spacer. Like we we talked about how Martrez Martrez Harrell is our, is our MVP, and he's kind of just quieted down. Like. We play the Sacramento Kings. From what I understood, I think Alvin Gentry uh, had to move on the league, the league and safety protocol. So I'm not sure what's going on. They say he may not coach at, uh, in this game. Again, we're going up against a team. They're 11 and 17. They're coming off a loss against the Raptors. They have lost three straight road games. The Aaron Fox is leading his team with 29 points. Those three games. Hopefully, a couple things in this game. Washington cannot let the game slip away from them. They cannot get into a hole and can't and can't come out of it. That can happen. They're going to have to make shots, and they're going to have to really, really commit to not make, turning the ball over. Like I think that the set. I I don't understand these guys. Just don't seem to understand what the system is. I I don't I don't understand that. I don't really know what's the issue like I don't know maybe is it is it maybe is it maybe Spencer Dinwiddie you know maybe he's not ready not you know they're not on the same page I don't know but again they're gonna have to make some shots play defense and it starts with Dinwiddie and Bradley Beal I I do this it, it's not hard But <laughs> the Sacramento Kings will beat the Washington Wizards 109-100. Guaranteed. I, I don't see it. I like I mean I I I I I hope the Wizards prove me wrong in this game. I'm just disappointed the way this team has looked. Like we were given we this whole offseason we were so we were sold on this old oh, x y and z and then i'm looking at this this team and it's like after 20 games what the hell and we can sit there and talk about patience but we, you know, we got bryant back hosh from more back that's energy yeah that's great but they are going to have to figure something out this this roster cannot stay the, the way it is all season you got to make a trade. You just have to. Um, Steph Curry is now the all-time three-point leader. Excuse me. Wrong clip. Congratulations! Oh, Oh, my God. Steph Curry, one of the best shooters in the game uh, from Davidson. I always was a fan of him. Um, Mark Jackson was serious. You know, when they drafted Clay, Draymond, uh, then they got Iggy in a trade, and obviously Durantes, Kevin Durant. Um, he got there. Like, Steph Curry, to me, is, is one of the best in the game. I think he will be the best shooters. Best shooter. I don't think, I think honestly, 
I was watching inside the NBA and they talked about that record will never be broken. I can see that record actually being challenged. I do. Um, and I think it's ironic. I think Stephen Curry passed uh, Jose Calderon and like assist, something like that, if I remember seeing that correctly. So um, it was a great milestone. It was great to see Ray Allen, a.k.a. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Shuttlesworth there, Ray, uh, Reggie Miller. His parents were there in the building. It was great that they were there. Um, so congratulations, Steph Curry. Um, now, we're already seeing with the NBA the amount of COVID protocol that have to be taken, uh, particularly with the Bulls. Uh, the Lakers actually canceled their practice. Um, I think Dwight, Howard, and Taylor Horton Tucker and Malik Monk all had to go into protocol. Um, then also to the Hornets, the Nets, Bulls, and the Bucks. Giannis had the inner protocol, James Harden. DeRozan, Lowry, I was like, wow. Um, and, and, it's, and it's really, and it's really, really uh, low-key kind of crazy right now. And I'm hoping that everyone gets their eggs in the basket. I think, I know this may sound crazy, but I think that with the NFL and the NBA just right now, I think cancel games for this at least a couple days, get everyone's eggs in the basket and continue from there. But what I'm seeing right now, it seems like, the leagues are going to continue to play through it. Like the NFL, same thing. They're trying to get through this season. And I just I, I don't really like it the way it's going. Um, Kyrie Irving, I know a couple of teams reached out to him about being traded. Uh, Kevin Durant, it was a great overtime game. <laughs> they beat they beat the uh the Raptors. Um again, I think Brooklyn was down. They didn't have. They had six players that they, they they were down, including James Harden and Bruce Brown, and Kevin Durant carried and won them in overtime. Also, to Kevin Durant, he, he tweeted, he tweeted, uh, "Skip Bayless, I really don't like you." I don't think a lot of people like Skip Bayless. I, I listen, Skip, Skip, you know he's paid the troll, but some of the things that Skip Bayless has said. It, it is it is a bit much, and you know he can act, he does get he can get under your skin. Um, I know that the players I know the player union in the league were talking about daily testing, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, now I was reading this article. Okay, this was talking about Rick Carlisle and Luca. So apparently in the in the article, uh, it talked about with Dennis Smith Jr. and and Luca being you know being cool because uh, we all know you know Luca was the third overall pick in the 2018 draft by the Hawks and was traded to Dallas, ironically for Trey Young, right? Dennis Smith Jr. was drafted ninth overall, and. Um, they talked talk about an article how you know Dennis got him up, got him a comfortable city, and you know they became fast friends. I think they even were roommates. Um, and then also, too, um, they did a lot of traveling together. So in the article, it talked about how Rick Carlisle in the front office were like, We're gonna start, we're gonna blow this whole thing up. Um Talk, really saying that the two of them didn't have the power to really speak their mind. Um, they knew Luca was going to be the, the piece, but they had no, they didn't see any potential in Dennis Smith Jr. Um, which I feel like if they gave him time, which I think you should give a player. I don't like everybody when they listen. Let, let, Stepping on the soapbox really quick. When you're drafted, ladies and gentlemen, I feel like a team should give you at least max two years to adjust not only to the league, but to the system of the team. Like, I understand that 
Dennis Smith Jr. didn't have a, have the greatest jump shot. Um, you know, if they just gave him time to develop, I think you would have seen a good player. And I actually, too, when you hear those things, ladies and gentlemen, that takes away your confidence. I think that gives that that they don't have the trust in you to be a great player. Rick Carlisle actually, from what it said in the article, doubted Dennis Smith Jr. saying he, he could actually be a starter. Um, he wanted them to get Donovan Mitchell, and it just didn't work. And then, unfortunately, they traded Dennis Smith Jr. to the Knicks for Chris Dats Porzingis. Now, um, according to what the article also was saying, that Rick Carlisle – um, pretty much came out and saying that he didn't like. He felt like Dennis Smith. That he felt like he tried to create this narrative that Dennis Smith Jr. was jealous, and um, that wasn't true. The players saying they weren't. Uh, that's what the players said. They, they accused him of saying Dennis Smith Jr. was jealous, and that never happened. Um, we all know he wasn't playing that well, but. I don't like that. And I think, again, I think that kind of, spe- I think that also too spoke to why he parted ways with Dallas. Um, now, I think that was the beginning of the end between Luca and, and Rick Carlisle for what the article was saying. Um, now, Rick Carlisle was in, Indian- in Indianapolis. Rick Carlisle stepped down in June. Um, now he didn't play Friday because he tested positive for COVID. Hope he's doing well. And Jason Kidd is now the head coach. Um, I don't know what this team is going to look like. Um, I just look at it like this. It's three years there's a lot of you can tell the Mavericks are dysfunctional. You can tell there's a lack of communication and threatening to blow it up like that. And for a team that hasn't won, that's built, they have they have the guy, but they haven't won a playoff series yet. I I, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, And the article also, too, talked about Rick Carlisle's, like, shouting at players. Like, I think it was uh, Sahai Missouri. Um, A lot of people were saying that Rick Carlisle just kind of became this guy where he kind of – it was just kind of starting to become – not a really great working relationship. Um, same thing I talked about with Chris Dapps Porzingis. Like a lot of things were going on. And I think I just think that the relationship between Rick Carlisle and the team those last couple years, it just wasn't going to work. Now, my fear is is that I think Jason Kidd's going to get this team going. I do. How much time Jason Kidd has is the question because I don't know if you can repair this relationship. Jason Kidd could, but with the front office, that's a whole nother thing. So if the Dallas Mavericks don't get it done, I'd say with this year, next year, and the year after, Luka Doncic is out. Guaranteed. That's That's just me. That's just me. Um, also, too, Ben Simmons was also uh, – his name has been thrown out there, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, with that being said, we're going to transition into Maryland football. Uh, we – it's National Signing Day. Looks like we've got a couple guys. Um, got a couple four-star, three-star recruits. Uh, can, you know, again, this just speaks to uh, what Coach Lockley is trying to get to this program. Uh, so far, he's had 15 commitments. Where we're ranked number 43 in the country and number 11th in the Big Ten. So, 
Uh, congratulate uh, so far the recruits are going. We got seventeen of them. Um, I can't wait to really see what is going forward for the Terrapins. I can't. I can't wait. Um, we're going to transition into basketball. The start with the women. The number eight Maryland Lady Terps lost to the number one team in the country. 66-59. I'm not going to even sit here and act like I didn't know this was coming. Or act like I know this was coming because I did it. Oh, my God. I have to pick my pride off the floor. Um, <laughs> I I don't know what to really say. Um, South Carolina was the better team. I will say this. Maryland defensively from the get-go, they threw different defensive zones at – South Carolina. I mean, we dared those girls to shoot. And we for the we wanted Aaliyah Boston to make her presence known inside the paint. In the first 17 minutes, she only scored four points. Um Angel Reese held her own. Um, I, this okay. This is just me. Okay, I I I get what she was trying to say. She she said she was a big guard, but she to me is she's a, she's a center. Okay, um, she had twenty points, ten rebounds. Ashley Wansu did not have a great game. She had eleven points and shot three of seventeen from the field. With oh phone. my god! And then on top of that, the Gamecocks. Beat us on the boards, offensively and defensively. 24 offensive rebounds and 24 second chance points. Like, we gave up 24 offensive rebounds. Especially, that, that can't happen. That can't happen. I, I, I know South Carolina, they were like in the top five last year. 2020 and 2019 and 64 34 is a rebound battle. Bullshit. This stings. This really does sting. I I felt like we 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 made it we we I felt like we could hold our own and we did that. Uh, just I, to me, this was disappointing. Um, it was a good game. Uh, I they just were the better team. They really were. However, the men beat ranked twenty Florida, which made me feel a little better. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Um, 70 68. Biggest thing I took away from that game defensively, we held uh Colin Castleton really well. Um, he actually, I ain't gonna lie, he's he was he was he's a he was a handful. Um, I looked at some games on YouTube, he's averaging 15 and almost 10 rebounds. He had 26 points against some a school, North Florida. Um, when it was all said and done, Castleton had nine points, ten rebounds, and three blocks. And he was really aggressive when we got him in foul trouble. Good job, boys. Um we were we found he found out the game where Fax Russell uh dashed, actually, you know, went to the rim and drew contact when with you know with the end with the go ahead layup. That's when he found out the game. Um Eric Ayala, I Again, was looked better. Um, I know he's having a shooting slump. He had 19 points. I think 
him, we, that's what we, we need. We need him. That's where we, we, we expect him to be great. Um, a couple other things, too. The team looked better overall. They really did. I'm looking at Hakeem, uh, Kareem, uh, Hakeem Hart uh, offensively. He had 11 points. from the, the, That was his, actually his first game where he scored in double dip, double digit double double figures. Um the last four games, he's only had well, and when he scores 10 or more points, particularly um he had 24 points against Richmond. He actually is not bad. He's not he can actually shoot the three. I think it's like 40, he shot like 42% on the year compared to last year. I think he was like shooting below 35. Um Again, also too, I, I'm just looking at if Hakeem Hart, Fax Russell, and Erica Ayala play. I think Maryland going forward, you're starting to see the wheels turn in Maryland's favor. And I get it. Maybe it's just you know it's getting the cobwebs off. We'll see. But it was a big win by the Terps. Uh, both teams don't play until after Christmas. So it's going to be weird not seeing them on TV for a little bit. Um, let's transition into Towson basketball. Uh, the women did not play against the University of Memphis. Uh, there was a positive test uh, within the team. Uh, the test was positive. We will play Penn State on the 22nd. We're 9-1 and one on the year. Uh, so that game has been canceled. Uh, it was just cautious, and uh, we'll probably play them at the end of the season. So that game did not happen, unfortunately. Um, we played Penn State. The is that the is that the Panthers? Looks like the Panthers uh, on the twenty second Wednesday. I think. That the Lady Tigers will beat the Penn will beat Penn State 70, excuse me, 75 59. The Lady Turks are nine and one on the year. Um, they're better home, they're a better home team. They're three and one on the road. And like I said, hopefully, most likely that game against Memphis will probably be played at the end of the year. Um, the men, we had a big win against the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Final score 74-64. Uh, we play, we're going to be on ESPN Plus. We play Navy, who actually just came off a big win against Army football. Uh, the Towson Tiger men will beat Navy 80-65. Guaranteed. Uh, the men, the the men tigers were eight and four on the year. We're on a two game win streak. We are four and one at home, three and two on the road, and so far so good. Looking pretty good. Um, let's transition into the WNBA. Uh, yes, I know the WNBA. We are almost at a point where the draft lottery is upon us, and. I don't know who's going to be with the draft lottery, uh, resent, uh, who's going to re represent the four teams for the lottery. But I have an idea in mind that Clamity Colesclaw, because she was our number one overall pick. We'll see. Um, I just wanted to really point this out. So I had to look back at some, some of the lottery picks and, um, Maya Moore, Brianna Stewart, Brianna Stewart, Elena Deladon, Neka Agumake, Brittany Griner, Janae Agumake, Asia Wilson, Liz Cambage. Um, all average four wins. They made their teams better, in a sense. Um, I feel like the lottery does, in a sense, help your team. 
Um, my only my only beef about the lottery is is that I would hope your team has a, has, has pieces where that you can build around that 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 lottery pick. Um, we, we all know, uh, you know, with in Seattle, Joel Lloyd, Brianna Stewart, Sue Bird, all number one overall picks. Uh, the the three to see Skylar Diggins, Elena Deladon, Brittany Griner. Uh, you know the Sparks, the Dream, Fever, Mystics. One of those four teams is going to have the, is in the lottery. All four teams in the lottery. The lottery is on the nineteenth. The Washington Mystics will have the number one overall pick. Guaranteed. I do. I. I. I think that. Okay. <laughs> it sucks because I remember the Mystics. The year was 2013. We had the fourth overall pick, and it was Taylor Hill, who actually, honestly, truthfully, had. Turned out to be a great player, just injuries. Um, which was kind of like shocking because I think that year, I think the Mystics had like a 1.8% to get Diggins or Griner or Deladon and never happened. Um, I do think you see some changes to the team. Like when we, like, even though, Again, I think front office matters when you don't put a winning team together. Like in Dallas, you had Skyler, you had Liz, and they weren't – and Odyssey Sims too, but they never really truly had a fundamental team built for them to compete. And then they go from uh, Tulsa because they were she was during, and they were the Tulsa shop, and then Dallas, and then the Dallas Wings. And, yeah, I, I do think – I do think – what you what you build around matters. Like the Indiana Fever, this is my opinion. You've got Kelsey Mitchell, Tiffany Mitchell, Kaiser Gondrzic, Victoria Vivian, Vivians, and Jantel Lavender. If you get another piece, I, I think the I think you got a, a you got a playoff squad right there. Guarantee. Okay, like the Sparks, they've got. Fundamental, they got the Gumake sisters, Christy Tolliver, Taya Cooper, Brittany Sykes, Erica Wheeler. Like they have some pieces in America. I can't I can't forget about Amanda uh B uh Zori. I can't forget about her. Um the Atlanta Dream. Relationship with your oh children. my god. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, and the Mystics. I'm not going to even sit here and act like I didn't know this was coming. Or act like I know this was coming because I did it. That, there's just, other than Arrow Atkins and hopefully Maisha Hines Allen, there's really nothing to really build off on New York. I mean, D.C. That's just me. I'm sorry. Um, I do think historically... Drafting, having a lottery team, I think does have good impact on your team. It's just about what you do around that lottery pick that matters. Like, look at the Minnesota Lynx, Maya Moore. Look at Brittany Griner. Look at the Phoenix Mercury. Asia Wilson in the Las Vegas Aces. I mean, it's it's documented. Good play, when you get a good player, but the thing is, here's the key. When you have pieces, that matters. It really does. Uh, oh, and the, 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 not the, um, the Dallas Wings also are in that too. Um, I'm scared. <laughs> I don't know what to expect on the 19th for the draft lottery. Um, I don't, but 
I'm, I'm confident that the Washington Mystics were the number one overall pick. Um, next topic within the WNBA, I wanted to talk about Tiffany Mitchell. Um, Tiffany Mitchell, another South Carolina Gamecock. She's one of my favorite players for, for, for the Indiana Fever. Um, had a really thought – yeah, I can't get the words out. A provoke a, a a post on Instagram where I thought it was very uh, important to, to talk about it because these are one of the things, particularly um, as African Americans, I think that we still face and still need and continue to hold people, companies, etc., whatever you want to say, accountable. Um, this was her Instagram post. So she plays currently overseas for uh, Australia. And on her post, she this is what she said, and this is verbatim. This post will be uncomfortable for some to read and inspiring for others to read. Throughout my first month here in Australia, I had little to none to no problem. I think she meant to say I had little to none, no problems. Uh, until this past week, I was met with a situation that was clear racial discrimination. I was approached about my hair and that for the start of the regular season, I was unable to play if I didn't tie my hair or wear, tie my hair up, excuse me, or wear it in a bun. An email was also sent out informing coaches and refs to make sure the rule was in place for the players with, with braids. Now, I don't know how many, how many, years this league chooses to enforce this fever rule about the length of someone's hair braids specifically of course people with free braids as they call it apparently it's clear only the black people in this league has these type of braids i've played all around the world in every top league at the highest level and my braids have never been an issue when i approached basketball australia with the discomfort it caused me reading and hearing about this email they stood on the fact that it was a FIBA rule and they were told to enforce it. But later they reinverted it because it's actually a rule in FIBA that wasn't in place anymore. You can clearly see in the second picture, uh, and I'll show that in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my first game, the pain I was still carrying because how, how are you enforcing a rule that's not even a rule anymore? The target I felt I had on my back was undesirable but still played with the disappointment I felt from Basketball Australia. I'm completely thankful for my club as it stood behind my teammates and myself that had braids and they were very supportive. To combat Basketball Australia and the false run that they put out, we took a knee during the anthem before the game. Did this change how I felt inside about the entire situation? No. But it gave me a sense of comfort knowing that the ladies that I showed up with every night had my teammates and eyes back goes to show we have a long way to go for equality all over the world unfortunate it had to be for those conversations to happen but happy that basketball australia is held accountable and become more aware of the ignorance that was displayed in the situation i'm going to share my screen so you can see the post of what she's referring to um so obviously this is tiffany mitchell these are her braids um, you can clearly look on her face. Obviously, I, I, I looked more closely. You could tell she was crying to me. Um, this is what she said. Uh, this was what the, I guess, the screenshot of the email braids. If a player, male or female, has their hair braided, it swings free from their head when their head is moved. It may cause harm to another player if struck by the braid. Due to injury that may have caused, players are not permitted on the court with free braids in their hair. There's more pictures of the team taking these in support of Tiffany. We take the need to support our teammates who suffered through facial discrimination, racial discrimination, excuse me, this week. We call on baseball straight, straight to do better. So uh, Patty Mills came back and responded, you know, wanting people to look at, you know, and understand like, hey, like we're not standing for this neither. Um, Team USA, I mean, USA basketball, they did apologize uh, for the rule. And a 
according to this, what we're saying Saturday, quote, the policy has been deemed discriminatory and inconsistent with basketball Australia's diversity and inclusion framework by the WNBL commission. The statement read, it's also not enforced in either WNBL league or other professionally professional women leagues around the world or international competitions, such as the Olympics and the world cup to end this, the WNBL commission has removed the pause policy effective immediately. And Basketball Australia makes an unreserved apology for anguish and pain that was caused by this rule. I think it's the, I believe it's the right thing to do. Uh, but why single her out makes absolutely no sense. But like she said, we still have a long way to go in terms of trying to fight for equality and holding those accountable. And I'm glad that Tiffany did this. Uh, Patty Mills spoke out because he's a, he's from Australia and he, I, he understands. Uh, you even have a lot of um, some of the girls like that Diamond the Shields, for example, they're all in support of it. They all, they all, we all, they all have her back. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't have braids. I, you know, I, my hair is is short. That's okay. But if I had braids, I would support Tiffany Mitchell the same way. Um, I mean, like, like Derek, like, and you see the NFL. Derek Henry's a good example, but like, it's like tied up ish. I've seen Larry Fitzgerald. I've seen uh, Devontae Adams. I've seen a lot of guys with dreads, braids, their hair gets pulled. I don't honestly, truthfully, like, I feel like if you pull their hair, that's, to me, that's, that could cause injury. But I, 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 I it, it's, to me, it's a part of the uniform, you know, just because they're free. Don't, 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 don't call that out. That That's not right. I, and again, I, I applaud her for calling it out. And that rule is BS. And most likely it was somebody who was like, oh, no, she can't have those braids. But again, like I said, it goes back to what I said. We have a long way to go when trying to change, trying to change the hearts and minds of people. And this is the first step. And you're going to see more. And it wouldn't surprise me if you've had other instances like this. And um, Tiffany Mitchell started the conversation that needs to be had. So I'm really proud of her uh, for that. Um, and really, I wish I, I should have, I'll show you the uh, the clip. Of her, I think after when she posted Okay, so that's Tiffany Mitchell. Here's like a those those clips. I don't have I don't have Instagram anymore. So she's obviously showing off the breeds. <laughs> and uh, that's the team she plays for. So like, come on, man. At, at the end of the day, like that's that that's just that whoever I don't that rule. I, I'm glad to get it. I'm glad to get rid of it. You know. Just sad. We, we, this world, we still got some work to do. Um, with that being said, I'm going to close it out with a couple things. Um, I'm going to first, again, send my thoughts and prayers to those that were affected um, by the tornadoes. 70 people in Kentucky, I know, have passed away and, and more. Um, there's an Amazon where, uh, a factory where they had people come in to work, but they should not have. I even heard where the weather forecasters didn't even give the people a heads up. Uh, this thing did over 200 miles worth of damage. That's like from here, Maryland, to southern Connecticut. Uh, and it's it's really, really sad. Um, because, you know, I feel, cause we're, you know, we're what, two weeks from the holidays and these kind and those kind of things happen. Um, I, I, mother nature, I hate it. You hate to see anyone lose their life. Um, but the most, but the very important thing is as communities, we stand 
together, we pick the we and we rebuild and we stay strong for one another. That's just me. That's just um, my philosophy. Just take it one day at a time and, you know, just put our faith and trust in God. Um, so I send my thoughts and prayers out to those that were affected. Um, next thing, this is my last word. Jason Kelsey um, talked about Lane Johnson and the things that Lane Johnson um, was going through uh, with depression, having to take antidepressants and different things like that. I'm going to play the clip. I just want to hear this is how he just overcame with emotion, just talking about, just talking about him. So much more into it when you're the one uh, getting the award. Uh, and I always reflect on um, other people that have either helped me or other people that are doing really well that aren't getting recognition. I mean, if you look at our team alone, I mean, I think Rodney and Erica McLeod last week, you know, raised over $200,000 uh, for their foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think Javon and Devante just did a, uh, you know, a, um, like a Christmas present shopping spree for, uh, families in a team or something like that. And we do charity events and, uh, community outreach events every Tuesday in season guys commit time on off days to go and do those. Um, you know, Lane Johnson and what he's openly come back from this year and to think, uh, about the uh, the amount of people that he's <sighs> um, the amount of people that he's given hope to. That's uh, ah, that's the business we're in. We're in the business of hope. You know what we do every day. What we do every game inspires millions of people. What we do off the field hopefully inspires people. And I think that that is something that, um, you know, I'm very proud to be one guy, a part of thousands of men who, who do that. So, Lane overcoming uh, the things that he was dealing with earlier. Hold on, I just want to make sure that it's actually sharing the way I want you to share it. Okay. I do apologize. I think it actually was doing it just fine. This year and being able to push forward and get back and play at the level he has and be the teammate he has and the person he has been, um, you know, that's it's a really impressive thing to do. You know, I think that when you deal with something for every single day or, um, you know, you know, where, you know, it's clearly um, affecting him and it's a much bigger thing than just football. Um, you know, you, you watch that happen and you see a guy overcome that um, and a guy that you really care about or a guy that, um, you know, yeah, that you really care about, overcome something like that. Um, you know, it's incredibly um, gratifying to watch. And, um, you know, to to know that that's something that, you know, millions of people across the U.S. struggle with, 
um, that, um, that, you know, millions of people across the U.S., um, you know, take medications for or whatever, um, to see a guy on a grand stage be able to come back and, and to, um, one, seek help, but two, um, you know, get back and move forward and move on, um, you know, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it. And um, that was touching. You know, obviously, you know, we on Lane Johnson, who he's gone through, you know, the last three games, he, he missed three games, you know, he's had anxiety and depression. And then, you know, he's had, uh, he was taking antidepressants. He stopped taking antidepressants that uh, he just, it's going through a lot. Um, I think AD, even the point where they played the Chiefs, uh, he got, he couldn't play, they, they, he got scratched from that game. Um, he just, I think the biggest thing for me um, is, you know, for me opening up, you know, for me, you know, suffering from my depression. Um, you know, I don't take any antidepressants or nothing like that. It's it's tough, um, particularly what you go through um, and the things that you've had to endure growing up. It's tough, um, but you have to learn how to seek help, resources, and just take it one day at a time. Um, it sucks. It really does. Um, I'm glad to see that he's back. He actually has been playing really well. Um, from what I know him to be, Lane Johnson's a great player. Jason Kelsey's a great player. Um, it just is amazing to me to see the, the strength and the courage that he has to persevere and live and fight every day. It's not an easy road, not an easy battle. And my message to each and every one of you is continue to stay strong. Uh, can, you know, Don't be afraid to seek help, talk to somebody. Um, and, you know, just it's your story. Don't let anyone else tell it. it it's not going to be an easy road. There are going to be challenges. And you just have to take it one day at a time. You do. And I'm just really grateful, you know, that you have guys like Jason Kelsey really be inspired by that. And that's my closing message. Be strong, be supportive, love one another. Um, Continue to thank God that we're at your lot the other day. Count your blessings. And um, on that note, this is episode three of the podcast. We've made it. Uh, the holidays are around the corner. With that being said, I'm out. Y'all have a good night. Stay up. Listen, I'm easy to find. And listen, they can kiss my ass if they don't like it. <laughs>